Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Router channel. As you know by now, I am a history buff. I enjoy books about history, both nonfiction and fiction. Now of the fiction, much of the stuff I read is alternate history, which is one of my three classes of steampunk, the alternate history version. I also enjoy novels written by historical writers, such as Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. Which at the time was a current novel, of course, or not that far in the past, I think, when he wrote it. I probably have the least experience with straight historical fiction, that is, books written recently that deal with historical events in a more or less accurate way. I was planning to do a show about that sort of historical fiction, and I was thinking, what have I read that people would like? Now, I remembered a book I had encountered a few years back, and I enjoyed it, so I went to Audible and got the next couple of books in that series. It's by a well-known science fiction author who classifies it as science fiction, even though, as I understand it, it is fairly accurate in historical matters. The series is called The Baroque Cycle by Neil Stevenson. <laughs> Stevenson is one of my favorite authors, and he's just two years younger than I am, and which makes him a tail end of the baby boom guy, tail end baby boomer. He's a background in science and engineering, which definitely shows in his books. You can tell that he's smart. He knows what he's talking about. His entire family on both sides has been into science and engineering and so forth in several generations going back. And he himself has a degree in geography, I believe. He was born in Maryland, but has lived mostly in the Pacific Northwest, currently in Seattle. One of the cool things about him is, from his picture, he looks like a wizard. He's got the shaved head. He's got the salt and pepper beard. He definitely looks like he's about ready to take a staff and cast a spell, which he does do with his books, in a matter of speaking. The Brooks Cycle is a series of historical novels written, well, probably written over some time because they're long, but they were published from 2003 through 2004. They are set around the time of the scientific revolution uh, and the enlightenment from the late 17th century to the early 18th. And uh, that is almost an American revolution, you know. Therefore, it's well before the age of steam as I define it, though they do mention steam power in the book, in one of the later books, and as I said, it did exist, it just wasn't common. The setting is mostly Europe, but also in places such as North Africa, India, and the Americas. As far as the genre goes, Stevenson calls the series science fiction because the books do include some fantastical, like fancical, fancical? <laughs> the books do include some fantastical elements in dealing with alchemy and things like that. There's also a strong focus on science and technology. Some of its characters are relevant and included, whether personally or their descendants, in some of Stevenson's other books, such as Cryptonomicon, which I have read and was published in 1999, another book that was long involved and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I personally think that his classifying this as sci-fi is marketing. It's like when a rock and roller does a country song or vice versa, and they don't suddenly start playing the rock and roller song on country stations just because it sounds like it fits. No. Um, they keep playing it on the rock stations, which means in the case of music, the genre depends more on the creator than the actual characteristics of the creation. In the case of fiction, it's not quite as hard and fast because you know it's a longer process. It evolves more over time. But the same rules more or less apply. An author has an existing readership, and he does not want to give up that readership. And therefore, you know, he says, okay, this is science fiction. And if the style is something the readers like, maybe they'll like that as well, even if it deviates from what they've come to expect. So back to the series. It is a little bit confusing because they've variously been published in three, seven, or eight parts. Yes, another one of those where you say, well, how many are in the series? I don't really know. Essentially, there are eight novels, but in paper form, they were combined together in three large books. 
you know, almost George R. R. Martin sized. And in audiobook form, they have been released separately, except for books four and five, which are combined. And it's not that these are much shorter than the rest, or at all shorter, but Stevenson notes at the beginning that he and his editor decided that since they were like a unified narrative, instead of having them sequential, they would ping back and forth between the two books. And that's what they do. Uh, they will, you know, give a chapter heading and then we'll say it's actually from this book and then back to the other book. And so it can be a little confusing, but it works. And since these are taking place simultaneously, it's, it's a lot like Game of Thrones, where they have the things in Westeros on one hand, and they have it in across the Nata, narrow sea with the Mother of Dragons. So anyway, they decided to make it one narrative. And the cool thing was that it was the same price as an audiobook, so you kind of got a better deal. Now, here are the eight books and the three volumes that constitute their paper edition. Volume 1, Quicksilver, which won the Arthur C. Clarke Award in 2004. Now, you see, science fiction, even though it's really not. Book 1 is Quicksilver, and that is Mercury, which is a big deal with the alchemists. And Isaac Newton was kind of an alchemist, right? Book 2, King of the Vagabonds. And in this case, Vagabond has a little bit more sinister notation uh, than it did now, it's more like possibly a highway robber. Book three, Odalisque. And I believe Odalisque refers to like a harem girl. It wasn't a word I was familiar with before I encountered it. Volume two, The Confusion, published in 2004. Winner of the Locus Award, another sci-fi award for a historical book. Book four, Bonanza. Not the TV show, nothing to do with the Wild West. Well, not much, unless you consider it the Wild West of Mexico. It's basically about gold and so on. And book five, The Junkto, uh, which is a kind of a conspiracy. It's related to the Spanish word junta, which we all are familiar with. Volume three, The System of the World, 2004. Again, the Locus Award, yet another sci-fi award. Book six is Solomon's Gold, and that's as far as I've gotten. Now, this refers to the alchemic legend that King Solomon of the Bible had discovered a special type of gold and he went across the world to find a place where, where the gold could be mined and he ended up at the Solomon Islands, which are in the Pacific. It's interesting. I had never heard that before. I don't know if that's actually true about the namesake of the, of the islands. Uh, book seven is currency, about actually about money. But it's not boring, I'm sure, yet judging from the other ones. And book eight, The System of the World. Now, these last two I have not read. But because you've all been asking for historical fiction, I decided that, yeah, I can give a pretty good impression of what these are like from having done six of the eight books. As far as the publisher, these were all published by William Morrow, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. So a major publisher. Again, I don't think these can be published by... HarperCollins in the present day. For one thing, he's a white male, and that's bad, you know, and it's too white and too male. So they would have probably said, no, no, you're evil, even though he's obviously got many liberal opinions. These books feature some very important historical characters, especially in the sciences, but also in the political arena as well. And uh, one of the major ones is Sir Isaac Newton, who's been shown as a rather interesting character, much more than we would think. Gottfried Leibniz, his rival, who also discovered the calculus at about the same time. Although they use different terminology, and we actually use, I think, more of Leibniz's terminology than Newton's. Newton was more instrumental in the theory of gravitation, you know, so that allows us to go into space. Uh, there was Sophia of Hanover. She was like an electress, which was Another word for a monarch, and she was very far-thinking. And finally, William of Orange, uh, who, who also became William III of England. He was actually Dutch, but um, rather instrumental in all these uh, political machinations after Cromwell. And these are just four of the many, but probably some of the more significant ones. Now, there are several principal fictional characters. The three main ones are introduced in the first three books. Each one has a particular narrative that the book starts. Number one, Daniel Waterhouse. He is a mathematician and a natural philosopher. 
He's also a religious dissenter, which kind of means he's like a Puritan, although he's not as strict. <laughs> and he's an associate of Isaac Newton. Went to school with him. He is a founder of MIT over in Boston. And his descendants appear in Cryptonomicon as also brainy mathematical types. Number two is Jack Shafto, a.k.a. half -cock Jack. There's an interesting story behind that name. I'll get into that later. He is a charming criminal who gets in and out of trouble throughout the series. One of several men, he is one of several, who falls in love with character number three, Eliza. And he is also part of the Cabal, a conspiracy by some Ottoman galley slaves of many nationalities who you know, get themselves free and, and become very wealthy and lose all their money and become wealthy and lose all their money again and again. Number three is Eliza, the one I alluded to earlier. And I don't remember her surname, and Wikipedia doesn't mention it, actually. It's weird. But she was abducted by Ottoman slavers as a girl. And she, being beautiful, ended up in the Sultan's harem. After being freed, she became the Duchess of Arcachon in France by a political advantageous marriage. And she becomes independently wealthy due to her shrewd investments. In other words, she's brilliant and also beautiful and as mentioned many times, and she is a friend of Newton's rival, Leibniz, who is kind of a mentor to her. The other important characters, or the most important characters, according to Wikipedia, are Enoch Root, a mysterious alchemist who is said to be immortal. And he appears in two other Stevenson books, Cryptonomicon, which I mentioned, and also one called Fall or Dodge in Hell, and I don't know that book. I haven't read it. I haven't actually even read a summary of it. But maybe at some point. The fifth one is Bob Shafto, who, from the name, you may judge, is the brother of Halfcock Jack. He's a professional soldier rather than a criminal, though he has a little dodgy at times. Now, the Wikipedia article lists a host of minor fictional characters and 48 historical personalities who appear in this book. They probably haven't caught them all. Uh, among them is Robert Hooke, who I will talk about later. He was another one of these early scientists who was a very bizarre character. Another of my favorites who had a brief mention was Edward Teach, also known as Blackbeard the Pirate. And I read a book about Blackbeard. I need to talk a little bit more about pirates in a future show because everybody loves pirates, right? You know, as long as they're not pillaging you personally. Now, Stevenson has an interesting style which combines science and very uh, authentic, knowledgeable backgrounds with swashbuckling adventure. In this series, that is the role of Halfcock Jack, Jack Shafto. The others, especially Daniel Waterhouse and his segments, they're a bit more cerebral. They're a bit more for the brainy types. Stevenson does incorporate lots of description, and in that sense, he reminds me of another of my favorite writers, the 19th century genius, Alexandre Dumas, the man who brought us the Three Musketeers. At times, you think that, like Dumas, he was being paid by the word. Uh, but it's not a bad thing if the words are good ones and entertaining ones, right? I've said the same thing about Dickens, because he can be very wordy at times. As I noted earlier... Uh, Stevenson introduces some fantasy elements into this historical milieu, including the search for King Solomon's gold. And that brings us the title of book six. Now, this legendary gold had alchemical properties because it was imbued with the philosophic mercury, whatever that means. In practice, they can distinguish it because it's somewhat slightly heavier. So where most people spend it like gold and waste the stuff, it is actually far more valuable because of its properties. Magical, we might say. Now, Stevenson also likes to speculate about the sex lives of some of these historical personalities. For example, since Newton never married and he never had a girlfriend, from what we know, he figures, yeah, Newton was gay, <laughs> which is quite possible. I consider that to be a, a strong possibility, except that I don't think that Newton ever had a lover because he was so religious. I can't imagine it would even occur to him to um, be in love with another man. But in the book, he does have a lover, an Italian scientist. And at one point, they're having this spat. And the Italian says, 
then why don't you go make love with Leibniz then? <laughs> Which I enjoyed thoroughly. I laughed so hard. Now, speaking of things sexual, you may wonder about the name Halfcock Jack. Well, it turns out that Jack, being a rather a uh, vagabond type, happened to contract the French pox, which is another name for syphilis. And at the time, of course, it was fatal. Now, the uh, cures, like giving mercury, were in some ways worse than the disease. So at the time, in the uh, late 1600s, one of the purported cures was to get circumcised, as most European men were not circumcised. Unfortunately, the operation was botched, and poor Jack lost half his manhood. And so strangely, and perhaps, perhaps unrealistically, Jack later recovers from syphilis by contracting a fever that is so high that it almost kills him, but somehow manages to kill off those evil spirochetes that are lurking in his body. Stevenson also does a great job with the archaic language of the time. And in some cases, it's a little annoying, such as his overuse of the word diverse. Now, by diverse, he doesn't mean like different races. <laughs> he doesn't mean like Hispanics and uh, Asians and, and uh, African Americans, etc. He means the old meaning, which was to mean like many or numerous. So uh, on the menu were diverse, delicious pastries. I mean, it appears again and again, and it's almost a little irritating. Uh, but he does have modern sensibilities, of course, as a modern writer. For example, since Eliza had been a slave and was later freed, she becomes an anti-slavery crusader. And there are several people like this in the book who are former slaves. In real life, many former slaves actually bought and owned slaves themselves and were resigned to this legitimacy as an institution. And so, you know, that's a little different. It's a modern view. You know, at the same time, Stevenson is not afraid to include some very politically incorrect humor of a subtle nature that would not be appreciated in the current day by people who have no sense of irony. Now, this is going to be my favorite example, which I'm going to bring forth just because. There was a minor character called Dappa, and he is part of Jack Shafto's crew after Shafto is free and they get on their own ship named Minerva. Dappa was one of the fellow galley slaves. He is an African. And he was, uh, as a child, exposed to many languages and became very fluent in them. And he acts as a translator. Now, he's also become an anti-slavery crusader. He writes pamphlets containing the stories of slaves who are, I know, through their heartache, he wants to make Europeans aware of how evil slavery is. And he is sponsored by... Eliza. She's rich, and so she helps him publish his books. Now, he, he that is Dappa, is in England at the moment. He's in London in a coffee shop, and he is meeting with Daniel Waterhouse, who is involved somehow in the investments in um, Shafto's ship. <laughs> it was very complicated. But to Daniel's extreme embarrassment, his idiot nephew appears. Uh, to talk to them. And the nephew is a journalist. Perhaps that is uh, redundant. In the current day, anyway, it would be redundant to say idiot journalist. <laughs> and he is a moron who had decided that because the guy he's interviewing is an African savage, he's going to dress like an ape, seriously, and talk pidgin English, like, mm, you come across great water in canoe. <laughs> and uh, so Dampa answers him, in very fluent and elegant French. Uh, being an African savage, although I speak 25 languages, I am like a parrot in that I do not understand what I'm actually saying. <laughs> and so it's hard to imagine somebody getting away with a joke like this in the current day. And it, and just, it goes over the guy's head. He just, he just can't seem to resolve himself with the fact that this is a really smart African that he's met up with. Uh, another case, he actually refers very quickly, a priest who is in disguise takes off his disguise and he's wearing Jesuit robes. And one of the characters said, I didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Loved it. And so 
Because uh, Stevenson is a straight white man, I don't think these books would be published in the current day. I really don't. They would say, no, straight white men have had their day. It's time to publish anybody of any other race for any reason, you know, whether they're good or not. <laughs> you know, but he's pretty even-handed in his uh, distribution of heroes and villains. Although I think more of the villains are white because these are the people in the power structure that the characters are dealing with. Uh, so, still, there are, you know, there are black heroes and there are white heroes and so on. You know, like Eliza, like like Jack Shaft, even he's kind of an anti-hero. He is a hero of sorts. And so, they don't pretend that white Europeans are solely responsible for slavery. Like a certain young woman in a certain book that I gave such a bad review to earlier this year. Now, he admits that the vast majority of these slaves were captured by fellow Africans and sold for profit to European slave ships. The character Eliza could certainly be considered a strong female character in the modern vein, because she's very staunch in her ideals, especially anti-slavery. At one point, she actually arranges for a suspected pedophile to die horribly, which I kind of enjoyed that too. But... At the same time, she's rather promiscuous, and she does enjoy the company of men, which I don't think would qualify her, because a modern strong female character has to be a lesbian, right? They have to hate all men. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's great, but I think it's even better because it's not woke. In a sense, I like to compare Stevenson, not just to Dumas, but to Thomas Pynchon, believe it or not. Now, I've only read two of Pynchon's books. Like Pynchon, Evenson likes to write about history, and he sometimes introduces many lectures about topics such as math and science. Like in one of Pynchon's books, he has mathematicians arguing about vectors versus quaternions. If you're not a math nerd, you won't know what those are. And uh, they've, they're almost like gangs, like, you know, in West Side Story, they're almost like doing battle over which is better. Now, Pynchon also likes to have a lot of sex in his books. And he gets explicit and kinky, whereas Stevenson, the sex is mentioned, but usually he doesn't go into detail. So it's a little bit better for the, you know, for the more restrained reader. He also has some fantastical elements. Now, Pynchons are a lot crazier. Like, sometimes the characters might break out into song <laughs> and have dance sequences and whatnot. Stevenson doesn't do that, thank God. But he does have like little jokes like the Spanish Inquisition. Now for rating. Now, as I said before, I'm planning to get away from numerical ratings because they're kind of one-dimensional. And besides, I've been giving almost everybody high ratings. Uh, and instead, I'm going to say whether I recommend it and for what kind of audience. I definitely do recommend this series, but you have to be somewhat nerdy to enjoy it. You have to appreciate a, a story that's somewhat slower paced than, say, you know, the typical modern techno thriller. But if, if so, you will very much enjoy it. And one of the things I love about this series is that despite the so-called fantastical elements, it is pretty well grounded in a lot of research. I can't imagine how many hours he must have taken to get all this together. At times, we do get a mini lecture about things like gravitation, things about currency as well. And it's not boring. It actually is interesting, you know, how financial markets operate. My eyes don't glaze over for a change. I like all these things about the books. Occasionally, though, it can be a bit much, and it kind of slows the action. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Also, with a very complex storyline, sometimes I get a little impatient to get back to the, the good action, especially with Jack Shafto. Now, there are scenes, I have to warn you, that are not for the faint heart, and that you may need to skip over if you have a sensitive stomach. One in particular is where Daniel Waterhouse assists the scientist Robert Hooke in vivisecting a dog. And this dog is conscious and alive, and they actually uh, disable its vocal cords so it can't scream. So you see, this kind of turned my stomach, but at, at, and it's turned Daniel Waterhouse's stomach as well. But Hook was kind of a lunatic, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, he himself was treating himself with mercury, so he died young. But he was the discoverer of, you know, uh, important advancements of the microscope and bacteria and science. So in a way, he did a lot of good for humanity. And uh, 
So very mixed character, but very interesting in that fashion. So this has been my review of The Baroque Cycle by Neil Stevenson, the renowned science fiction writer who also loves history. Please let me know what you think about it in the comments below. I always appreciate suggestions, and this is the outgrowth of one of those suggestions. Also, please like and subscribe so I can continue to get out the good steampunk slash historical fiction word. Also, check out my books on Amazon. As always, I will have the links in the description. I am still working on getting something else out. I swear. I swear I am. But I'm just not the world's best at multitasking, unfortunately. But sometime this year, I think I'll have one. And probably next year as well. So, for now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.